Boys, welcome back to another episode. I'm here with Adam Kavanagh. Adam, welcome, mate. How you going, man? Good. Good to be on. I've, uh, yeah, no, I'm stoked to have you here. We've, we've talked for quite a while now. I actually sent you a, a message on Instagram. So your Instagram is at Adam underscore Kavanagh, which is K-A-V-A-N-A-G-H uh, for the listeners. But yeah, I sent you a message after you put up a photo or a video when you were in in Northern Territory eating snails from the beach. You were just walking around through little, little waddling, waddling water and grabbed some snails and chucked them straight in the fire. And uh, I was like, I just need to know what it tastes like. So I sent you a message and you're like, oh, it's just like mussels. It's, uh, it was kind of quite interesting. I was, I was spending quite a lot of time in the bush at that time. And the, the whole theory of living off of the land is something that really, really appeals to me. Um, and you were kind of out and doing it. So I thought it was, it was really quite cool to kind of catch it at that moment. But I mean, you've been on quite the adventure just in general recently, uh, which I want to dive deep into. I think your Instagram is one of the best Instagrams to follow. Um, for those who haven't seen it before, jump on and make sure you check Cheers, it out. Man. Yeah, I think you did some pretty interesting <laughs> stuff. And uh, what I'd love to kind of talk about, Adam, is actually just your your story a little bit, like your background and what made you go adventuring. Because I know that you've got a story that probably a lot of people can relate to uh, in regards to how work was and what what happened with your life in general and, and how that kind of how you've changed it around now. Yeah, man, for sure. Um, do you mean to jump straight into it? Or? Yeah, dude, let's go for it. Go oh, deep. Um, yeah, oh, th- thanks again for having me on, man. Um, yeah, so I guess my story all started, uh, well, I guess if you want to go right back, like when I was a kid, I was pretty lucky. I grew up on a, a cattle property um, and I was always running around, uh, you know, rolling over rocks and catching lizards and bugs and spiders and stuff like it's like growing up like it's just always sort of what I did and then um yeah we kind of moved to town and um like mining towns and pretty much like the the thing was if if you're in a mining town and you're not in the mines like why why would you be there (laughs) um and yeah like once I sort of left school, I, I farted around a bit with a few, you know, laboring jobs and stuff like that. And then um, when I was 19, I got a job uh, at, at at the mines. And um, yeah, like I was, I was at the t- like obviously at the time I was pretty stoked mm. to, to get into the mines, um, just because you know it's what everyone else was doing, you know. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. and it, you know, good money. So I, I was pretty stoked. That's the dream, right? Like good good job, good money. It just that's that's what it seems as. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, get a good job, get a good, get good money, buy a house that you probably can't afford, and <laughs> um, yeah, she's all sweet. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I won't lie; like I, I, I really bloody enjoyed it at first, and um, I mean, probably even still to a degree. Like I enjoyed it right up till when I quit. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I I ended up working in the mines for about nine years. Mm. And um, in that time, yeah, like the my my health sort of went to, to shit. Hey, to be honest, like mm-hmm. um. Anyway, where did I go? With that yeah. So like my my uh, it was a few years before I quit the mines. Actually, like the 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 wheels are really falling off, and like yeah, I, I got um like hyperthyroidism or just yeah. like an uh, overactive thyroid gland. And um, I mean, yeah, there's like probably so many reasons why that happened, and um. I mean, I can't blame all that that on the mines. I, I found out recently I'm a, like a celiac as well, so that kind of um, gluten intolerance uh, isn't isn't the best for thyroid. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So my thyroid played up, and I went to the doctors and that here, and they were pretty much like, "Oh, yeah, this is kind of weird because normally it doesn't happen to guys so much," and they just couldn't work it out. They're just like, "Oh." She'll be right, man. Like, you know, she'll be right. Like, just ride, ride it out, see what happens. And um, to be honest, when when it first happened, I I woke up one day and I'd I'd um, never like I've never I, I probably would have had depression and stuff in my life, but um, like the day I woke up when my thyroid first played up, like I've never experienced anything like that. Hey, like it was the 
darkest shit I've ever felt. Like it was just this horrible feeling. And, um, it, it, it was triggering off like panic attacks and, mm. um, what they call it like impending doom. Like you just feel like you're going to die for no reason. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> and uh, it was, it was fucking horrible, man. Like, I, I don't know if you've had anything like that yourself or not, not quite. Like I've, I've definitely worked with a lot of people who have panic attacks. I've worked with people who have hypothyroidism or hypothyroidism, like the opposite side of it, but never actually witnessed it myself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it's it's nasty as man like you wouldn't wish it on mm, anyone mm. and um yeah like so that was something i had to deal with for a while and um as time went on um i i i guess cuz the doctors weren't like it just it was sort of ongoing and it got to the stage where the doctors were like you know like this is the what we can do and it all involved you know medication mm-hmm. or surgery and i and i I was kind of baffled because I guess I'm a curious person and I, I was sort of like, well, why am I sick? And they didn't know, like even they didn't, you know, put two and two together yeah. into the equation. Like food was just not even, couldn't even be part of it to, in, to, to them at the time mm. and not to them. It's just like, it's just the way the system is out where I live. Yeah. And um, yeah, like I, I stumbled across, I started reading books, which was weird for me. Like I used to like <laughs> never read books and, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, like I just started reading books and I was like trying to find as much knowledge as I could. And, um, I stumbled across one word in this book about thyroid and it said, uh, the caveman diet. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, Oh shit, this I was like, Oh, right. Yeah. And I like looked into it more and it, it was really making sense. And I'm like, right. Yeah. So like literally the next day just dived in head first into mm-hmm. what you'd call paleo or the caveman diet. And, um, yeah, like thyroid went away, like didn't have any issues. And I was like, ah, oh, sweet. And um, that really kickstarted it like a journey into to, to learning more about myself and health and all this sort of stuff because it like never meant anything to me before. I just had to get sick to, to kind of find my, my path into it. But yeah, um, yeah. and then um, that was really the start of it, to be honest. And I stayed in the mines for a while and, and my health got better. But I, I always just I, – I knew there was something – it just – something just wasn't right. Like I just knew I, – I felt pretty good, but there was just – I don't know. Like I, I had a few events happen in, in my life um, with like family deaths and stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, shit, like life's pretty short. And then, uh, yeah, I was just really – in a, in a place where I thought like, what am I, like, what am I doing here? Is this really what I want to be doing? And, and yeah, I just, I just made the decision one day. I was like, stuff it. I'm going to quit my job and travel Australia. (laughs) And, um, here I am still going, like it's been over three years and yeah, I'm still, still touring around. Yeah. That's so sick. Just a nomad life. But, um, I think there's, there's a lot into that. Like, like you said, you almost need to, you need to become sick before you had any realization into what your health and what what like how your life could be um, any different. But I think that's unfortunately that's how it works for most people is they need to have a pain point heart like that's that's painful enough for them to be able to move forward um, and to be able to progress to look into something or anything else. But I think the thing that was relatable was around the the stress side of thing. It works like. I don't know. I think people underestimate what stress can do to the body, how it can cause, like the things it can cause to the body. And um, even with your diet, that creates stress. And that's what potentially would have created the the hypothyroidism that you are having. Like it's down to diet and lifestyle. It's not just one or the other. And um, to see you completely shift it around and change it around and now travel around Australia for three years on end is pretty incredible. Yeah, no, you're right, man. Um, like the, the, the stress was a huge part of it. Um, and, and like you said, like you got, you have dietary stress. Like mm-hmm. I was eating, you know, I was like eating, I was smashing gluten, man. Like I used to think eating like two pizzas for dinner and shit was healthy, you know, cause yeah. it was like, I was like, I had meat and ve- vegetables on top of the pizza. I was like, <laughs> I'm crushing it. I'm like, I'm living the dream. And, uh, yeah, like so there was that sort of stress. And then, if you want to get like more down the rabbit hole, like in the mines, man, you know, working around diesel and mm-hmm. oils and the toxins, chemicals, yeah, like, yeah, that's that's going to have a stress load on the body. 
as well as I kind of got um, thrust into being a union delegate yep, yep. <laughs> at work. And, oh, man, like you want to talk about stress. <laughs> like, I, I, um, I, I tend to be a pretty passive guy and not like definitely um, – I'm not usually in for an argument or a fight or anything like that. Yeah. And then to be a union delegate and you're like <laughs> arguing with the, with the mind bosses, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, it's stressful. So, it, it, but yeah, it, it all stacked on top of each other. Hey, like just – and then um, shift work, like not getting sleep. Like mm-hmm. I used to Massive. basically do the night shifts and I wouldn't sleep at all. Like I do three nights in a row. I wouldn't sleep between those three nights Jesus. and to be honest that's half why I quit too I was like I'm gonna kill someone I'm gonna kill myself mm-hmm. like doing this yeah but um yeah so many people it, it, it depends where you're at like I mean you can do it but for some reason since once I got sick my body just could not tolerate shift work anymore like yeah. I just couldn't physically do it anymore so. You're literally taking years off your life by not sleeping. Like so many people say, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead, but you're just going to bring death around a lot quicker if you're not sleeping. There's so much goes into sleep and that's when we recover. That's when your brain gets to recover. It's when your body gets to recover. And if we're not sleeping correctly, and that sounds kind of weird, it's like, isn't it just sleep? But no, there's so, it's like go so in detail with sleep, like your sleep hygiene, your sleep routine, the different things that we're doing before bed can really affect how we're sleeping. When you're sleeping is massive as well. Like there's a circadian rhythm of the world and wherever you are in the world based on how the sun is can really affect or it does affect how you sleep um and so when the sun goes down typically we're meant to get ready for bed but now we've got all these fake lights in the world and so you've got lights on in your house and your body's not sure when it should be going to sleep it's still still alert still aware we go to lay down to go to sleep and you never actually have a deep quality level of sleep because your brain still thinks it should be awake so it's quite this i don't know it's like a perpetual cycle that's happening at the moment in the world and people are having to have that realization of I need to look after my health and my lifestyle because otherwise I feel like shit every day. It's not a good way to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, with what you were saying before, like, oh, well, uh, yeah, I should say like, um, when I got sick, that's when I realized how important sleep was. Mm. Like Mm -hmm. never used to care about sleep. Like it used to be like a badge of honor to like, (laughs) You know, like how, how, how big of a weekend you could have had yeah. without sleep, and <laughs> and now, yeah, it's so funny, but it's so true. Like it's so bloody important, and we just don't, you know, people just don't don't, don't realize it. how important it is. You know, so. yeah, definitely. So I mean, stepping out of the the work realm, then you went on your adventure, started started going. What was the what was the original thought? Like, okay, I'm just going to take my caravan and go for a trek, or was it like I don't know? Was it always going to be indefinite? Um, to be honest, like years before I, I quit to go traveling, like it was something that I've always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Like I remember like writing lists out of things that I'd, I'd need to take or pack. Mm-hmm. And um, to, I, like I don't even know why I wrote lists, but I had, you know, just like a list of all these, you know, tools and um, like equipment that I'd need to travel. And then eventually, yeah, like I was like, oh, shit, like I'm going to do this. That's sick. And uh, initially I – I uh, didn't have a trailer or anything. Like I, I have a camp trailer now, but uh, initially I just had a four-wheel drive mm-hmm. and I was just sleeping in a swag next to my car. But um, to be honest, I had absolutely no plan. I just I just knew I, like I wanted something to change. I just wanted to make something happen. Yeah. So I literally just, just quit and just headed north, like up into like towards Cape York. Like I had zero plans, just, yeah. just started heading off. That's incredible. So, <laughs> that's so cool um and so i mean when did when did you get the caravan like oh sorry the camper trailer how long how deep in were you before you decided okay i should get something with a little bit more functionality to it yeah i think it was about uh a year in mm-hmm. i i was heading down to tasmania and i'm um, heading down there for winter yeah. and because i because i'd been traveling for a while i was like oh you know like maybe i need to um upgrade here a bit and make life a bit easier because I had so much crap in my car, like literally I could barely fit in the car to drive it. <laughs> so much crap in there. And then, um, yeah, heading down to Tassie, just got on Gumtree, found a trailer. I was like, well, that's the one. Yeah. So I literally bought it like a couple of days before I got on the ferry to head over to Tassie. And, um, yeah, still got it. It's probably like it's – I'd say, well, it's not the same trailer that I left with anyway. Like it's fallen yeah. apart a few times. But How many, so, many cases has your car got on at the moment? 
I'm um, actually on my second car. Yeah, okay. My my first Land Cruiser pretty much, um, yeah, burnt it out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. My other one's, I don't know, it's got like 400 or 480,000 or something. I don't even know, That's to be honest. Well well. I don't even look at the Ks. You don't need to. No, I'm, exactly. I'm one of the other cruises they just keep going so. yeah so i mean things to talk about i think are, uh, how much stuff do you actually need when you're traveling about i think people probably are constant overpackers taking way too much stuff with them for say a weekend when you're going away for an indefinite amount of time like how do you decide what you're going to take and what's important yeah, yeah um t- to be honest i when i first headed off i pretty much took everything and the kitchen sink <laughs> like I had so much gear and as I started traveling I just started to realize I was like wow it's like so much of this stuff like I, n- I never even touch it or use it or mm-hmm. anything so like literally at the moment the trailer is pretty good storage so like to be honest really to go traveling like it, it, um with the way I eat I can't really just eat anywhere so I need a fridge so I've got like a little angle fridge yeah a um, few jerry cans for water and my swag like that was literally it and um, like a little gas cooker yeah. that was it like barely took anything and my bow obviously <laughs> no that's sick man and then how about clothes wise like you're pretty much just recycling the same clothes pretty frequently actually when I was in Tassie I had a goal so for a year I only um wore op shop clothes <laughs> that's sick yeah it was just like just a i don't know just a mission i set for myself i was like sw- like stuff it you know like because i used to when i worked in the mines you know like everything was you know all surf brands yeah you know, like hundred dollar t-shirts and 150 dollar jeans and all that sort of shit and then um out on the road after a while i was like why am i doing this like i'm out in the bush mm-hmm. getting mud and shit all over <laughs> these like really good clothes i'm like this is stupid so I um yeah just started going to op shops and I think maybe the whole time I was in Tasmania and for like the whole year maybe I spent like a hundred bucks on clothes no from op shops and I was like yeah maybe I need to go back to that actually I've gone back <laughs> to surf brands again <laughs> expensive hobby I actually had a friend who's like she's I don't know she puts herself out there as if she's a model with the clothes she buys and she actually took a whole year off of buying any clothes so she had to recycle all the stuff she used. Um, and she did it. Everyone was saying, no, there's no way you're going to do it. And she made it through. She did really well just to like recycle her old clothes and change them up. And it actually makes you think a little bit more rather than just being like, oh, I need to buy a new shirt. I need to buy this new, new bit and bits and pieces. I think the recyclables are always a good way to do it though. Yeah. And that, like, it, it was just a cool mission. I set, like a target I set for myself and exactly like, like your, your, your friends done, like it's, it's pretty achievable. Yeah. It's like a good way to save money too. Like, you, you know, think you about your wardrobe, like how much of it do you actually wear? I've got like... Exactly. Because I train, I've got so many shirts that I sweat through each week. But outside of that, like there's not that many shirts that I recycle or and that I actually go through. I've got probably 30, 40 there and I use 10 of them. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, that's it. So especially if you're wearing expensive clothes and you're doing like gym stuff or whatever, you probably don't want to be wearing your $100 shirt at the gym. No, no, I don't exactly. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's a bow hunting podcast, when did you pick up a bow? Like when did you first start bow hunting? Sweet. Um, yeah, my brother's actually got me into it. So, oh, yeah, I don't even know what age. Must have been like around like 15 or something like that. They, they started, um, oh, even younger than that, to be honest. When we were kids, we used to make like bows yeah. with like, a yeah, bit of uh, pieces, like string and sticks and yeah. um, you'd get like a straight stick and like you'd wrap a big ball of uh, duct tape on the end and we'd shoot each other with that. <laughs> and it, 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 as we got older, like I guess it just progressed from there. Like my brother started buying a few bows and yeah, I thought I was like, yeah, that's cool. Like wasn't really into it just yet. And then they bought some compound bows and I was like, wow, okay. And they watched a few hunting DVDs and um, – like that, I was like, "Wow! Like this, there's actually some skill involved in this." Yeah. Because um, we, were, like, my brothers and I, we were always out in the bush, like you know, catching snakes and <laughs> just riding BMX and doing stuff. So I was like, "I was like, sweet! Yeah, like, there's something else I should get into as well." So I started getting into it, and then um, I got right, right into it. Like mm-hmm. I was like, "Wow! This is definitely my kind of thing." And um, yeah, like it went from there, and then and then like for the fact that 
you can get your own food. I was like, oh, wow, because, like, that was a big, big part of us as kids and in my family growing up. Like, you know, we'd go out and shoot rabbits or, you know, stuff like that for food. And then, it, yeah, it just kind of progressed from there. Like, the bow just was like the, was like the first step for me at the time. Yeah, that's yeah, cool, get, man. Um, I think so. Something that you've done is gone and used both the the wheels and the stick. Um, so compound as well as your recurve bow. When was the transition back to the recurve bow? Yeah, so there's uh, Jack Spinks yep. and Cap- Captain Bowman uh-huh. and uh, C- Carl Brown, and uh, yeah, like I was watching their videos of of them shooting the stick bows, and I was like. I was like, that's incredible, like the skill that they have. But I always thought I was like, ah, oh, stuff that. Like I'd, I'd, I don't think I'd get into that. And then um, I went went out and caught up with Jack out on out on his property and um, all these guys were shooting the sticks into like a hay bale and how good they were with them. I was like, wow, like that's actually pretty bloody cool. Mm. Um, and I, I was there with the compound and I kind of felt a bit, I was like, oh, well, I'm the odd one out here. <laughs> and um, – like it just looked like a bit of a challenge and I love a challenge. So yeah, Jack really baited me up. He's like, Oh, you should go into the, you know, should go into traditional bows. And so I, I eventually did. And then, yeah, it's pretty good at first. And then I was lucky enough when I was down in Victoria, I went and caught up with, um, Captain Bowman mm-hmm. and he, yeah, he like showed me so much and like how to tune them and like some next level stuff. Yeah. It, it had to be, be, good and efficient with a recurve and um yeah he took me out on my first hunt and got a nice fallow buck and it sort of went from there i was like wow and then uh to be honest yeah i was right into the stick bow and and i kind of swore that i'd probably never pick up a compound again (laughs) and then uh i was up in the gulf and a boar uh ripped me up like attacked me and i've got like some scars and shit no way Uh, yeah that, yeah, like I got a bit, I uh, got a bit too close with the <laughs> with the recurve and um, didn't go too well. So did you so, get a shot off on it first and then it attacked you, or did it just realise yeah, you were there? Yeah, no, I, I I shouldn't have. Like I took the shot and all was sweet to be honest. And then, like yeah, thought I hit it pretty good, and because the grass was so long, I I was like followed the blood trail and. Like literally the first step into the long grass, I stood on the boar oh. and because it, it basically just ran in the grass and stopped. Mm-hmm. And I, I was so impatient and my like heart was thumping that like normally you'd just wait and you'd give it a bit before you'd go track them. But yeah. I was just so pumped. I thought, oh, yeah, sweet, I'll just go now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I walked in the long grass, stood on the boar and it just That's launched so me good. and just pizzled me like, oh, yeah. Like I'll, I'll never forget that anyway. And then – Far um, out. So actually, like, literally, just ran. Like, did it hit you straight on the belly, or where did it get you? Like, straight in the legs, and that just tumbled you. Uh, it, it was trying to get me in the legs, and I put my hand out, and it like it ended up with my hand in its mouth, holding oh. it off me, and had my bow on its head, and uh, <laughs> like I felt like I felt really bad, like because you, when you when you bow hunting, you never want to do a bad shot on an animal, but oh. it was just more maybe not the shot was so bad, it was just the my adrenaline. timing. Yeah, yeah, like I just I. Once you, if an animal gets a bit of adrenaline, like it gets a bit of a second wind, mm-hmm. I kind of, I kind of accidentally did that to the animal, and I paid the price for it. So, dude, that's hefty. What was the aftermath for you? Did you have to get stitches or anything? Uh, I I went to hospital, and because uh, I was out pretty remote, yeah, I had to like, um, drive like three hours back to town. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was yeah. Like I was even thinking on the drive. I was like, oh shit, that could have that could have been way worse. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't tell him where it was and <laughs> whatever. But anyway, um, yeah, I drove back to town and it was funny. Uh, I got to the hospital and they it, they were pretty much flat out, so they had no one to really CG. help me out. So yeah. uh, the doctor like give me one of the like local anesthetics in the hand, and he's like, oh, I'll be right back and we'll we'll clean the wound out. And I was like, oh, okay. And I sat in the room for like 40 minutes and I was like, uh, is he coming back? Because like I was getting feeling back in my hand again. <laughs> and he, he, he'd come in with his brush and he's like, oh, sorry, bud. You'll have to clean it out yourself. We're pretty flat oh out. Oh, my so, God. <laughs> yeah, I had to – oh, it was – oh, bro. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do all right it, with blood? 
Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm all right with that stuff. But yeah. it's just, I, I can tell you when you got like the fatty tissue mm-hmm. hanging out of your hand and you're like having to put a brush in there to, to, to clean it out, like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> and the anesthetic had wore off and oh, I, it was pretty brutal. Yeah, so. That's crazy. Anyway. That's the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, and so what, you put down the recurve after that? Uh, sort of. I, I haven't been using it as much, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, I, I, I still pull it out and I'll definitely get back into it again. But yeah. I guess where my travels have taken me recently, I've sort of been spending a bit of time down south and um, whenever I do get the chance to hunt, it's so much easier to pick up the compound because you know you can you don't have to shoot it every day to to be, stay good with it. Yeah. But like with the recurve, it's it's basically like it's an art form. Like you've got to do it every day if you want to be really efficient. Definitely. But yeah. Yeah, dude. I I started the opposite way and started with the recurve and realized how hard it was going to be. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to upgrade, get a compound, and I've got the intention of going back to the recurve eventually. Um, I'll definitely get back there but I was putting in so much time with my recurve to start with and it's definitely backed off in particular recently whilst we've had our daughter like the last eight weeks I think I've shot my bow once the last nine weeks even shot my bow once so it, but at the same time it, I was still hitting a tennis ball at 30 metres so I'm like hey I'm stoked on that like things are still good and it's just like you said picking it straight back up and being able to shoot it makes such a big difference um, compared to the recurve where I was at it every single day and it was only after weeks and weeks of practice that you start to get any good at it. But I think something massive, like you said, was seeing someone to talk, talk, talk you through the, the, the archery or talk you through how to use your bow properly is massive. Um, I did the same thing, just went out for a little shoot at one of the local clubs with a guy who had a Rico bow. Um, his name is Adam as well, Adam Barter, and he, he took me through so much. And it just opened my eyes to how much I didn't know about it. And it was, it was crazy. It was really cool. Yeah. Oh, congratulations, by the way, man. Thanks, dude. Span and your little family. That's cool. Yeah, she's awesome. She's been so so much fun. Everyone was, I think we were talking about yesterday about everyone um, trying to prep you for the worst, but we've really had such a gem. Like, she's so awesome. She feeds, she sleeps, she does everything she's meant to. I've only been pooed on twice, so I think I'm doing pretty good as a dad. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, What do you reckon you'll get them into? Uh, oh, definitely. I'm, I'm already up. trying to figure out when we can take her out. Like, I just want to go camping with her at least. Like, I'm just, I'm right now. I'm just craving an adventure. So we're taking her to the beach for the first time this weekend, which would be sick. We've just had visitors nonstop, so we haven't really been able to get out. But this weekend we'll go to the beach, and I think early January we'll hopefully get up to the farm, which would be sick. So take the take the trailer up and just yeah, have a camping from as young as we can, so she's just used to it. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah. I think there's so much you can learn just from being out and about with nature. Um, like even just the act of learning to be bored is massive. I think like I was like you, I grew up on a cattle farm for a little bit and you just had to make your own fun. You had to figure out what you were doing each day when you were out and about. And there's obviously so much you can be doing out in a property compared to maybe in the backyard somewhere. But I think the act of being bored is, is something that is a lost skill now. Yeah, you're right, actually. Like, in my journey, I guess I didn't realize when I quit to travel what I was really setting off to do. And I guess I was setting off to heal heal myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly what you're talking about right now, like, I I don't know why, but I just knew. I was like, I just want to get up into, like, remote Australia and get into the bush and just do that. And just like you said, man, like – we've forgotten how important that actually is, you know, like it being out in nature and just getting covered in mud and crap and Mm. just doing all that sort of stuff is so healing. And, and, um, yeah, like to to be honest, it's like probably the the biggest health tool that I have. Like, Mm. I guess, yeah, I'm still using it right now and I'm I'm about to go use it even more again. (laughs) Like I'm keen to get back into, back into far North Australia again. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it's so much, gets taken for granted now but we're so sun like cautious here in australia we're always lathered up we're always covered up completely everyone's wearing sunnies and um then there's yeah people wearing shoes wherever they go like they forget about the natural elements that are actually quite important for health um things like grounding things like getting out in sunlight without any sort of wear uh like 
any sort of eyewear or whatever can be really quite beneficial for the individual and talking about the circadian rhythm before I was, I was going on about it's really important for your um for your sleep cycles to make sure you're getting out in the sun each day getting out and without those glasses or anything you've actually got you've actually got this hormone that gets released when you go out in the sun if you're not wearing sunglasses that will get released to protect your skin from being so burnt whereas if you go out with sunglasses on all the time you're never releasing this hormone so you just never get the skin protection that you need which is kind of crazy right like everyone thinks i'm going outside i'll put my sunnies on they go outside they get super burnt and now it's like we have to be more sun cautious whereas it's almost like if you can revert back a little bit you you can save yourself and i'm not saying that not wearing sunnies stops you from getting sunburned you still get sunburned that's still a thing but you have a bit of bit more resilience to it it's kind of crazy yeah actually just yeah okay yeah, I've got heaps to talk about on this stuff. Go for it. When I used to work in the mines and as a kid growing up, like, you know, I was always getting covered in, you know, sunscreen and zinc mm-hmm. and all that. And I used to be so, well, I mean, I'm still pretty pale. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I used to be like literally so pale. It wasn't funny. Like I even just, if I even just went out into the sun for like a minute, I'd be absolutely roasted. Mm-hmm. And so that encouraged me to use even more yeah. sunscreen yeah. and stuff. And I got to that stage where literally like I just – even like 6 o'clock in the morning if I went outside for like 10 minutes, I'd have like three-degree burns. Yeah. And uh, what, so when I started traveling in Australia, like I, I, I was really doing the research into like all this um, alternate health or holistic health, whatever you want to call it. And a lot of the, the information said about, you know, maybe not – using sunscreens because maybe you know maybe they're doing more harm mm. than actually just having some sun so i i stopped using sunscreen and to be honest the craziest thing happened mm. i actually stopped getting sunburnt yeah Don't like tolerance I'm, yeah I probably have like some sunscreen company <laughs> come and take me out now but um <laughs> i yeah like within reason like obviously i've, I've still been sunburned on the odd occasion um yeah. when i push it too far you know like you, you still got to be you still got to be sun smart mm-hmm. but my tolerance has built up and just like what you're talking about now with the not using sunglasses I in the last year actually for some reason I, I, I used to I still used to wear my sunnies a lot and then in the last year I just um well, actually, I was out catching snakes with my indigenous mates up north, and I, I accidentally broke my sunnies in half. Yeah, and I was like, "Ah, oh, well, like We're that's done. the end of that." Yeah, and I actually, like you're saying, once I stopped wearing sunnies altogether, like I had heard about it, but you know, there's conflicting information. Some people are like, "Oh, you know, like you probably should wear sunnies," and then mm-hmm. other people are like, "No, like you know, it actually is going to be better for your skin because you like you you know your eyes are registering the sun." So. Yeah. Once I stopped wearing the, the sunnies, I, my skin actually started to get really tanned. And yeah. I was like, what the hell's happening here? Like, you know, <laughs> I, can, I can handle the sun even better now. So it's it's crazy, yeah, like, right? It's I, crazy. The, the less you do, the better. I was much the same. I just kept breaking on my sunnies. I'm so rough on all the gear that I use. And uh, I was like, oh, fuck it. Like, I've spent so much money on sunnies. I'm just going to buy, not buy any and just see how it goes. And then we started looking to more of this research anyway with the stuff that we do with the company. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, it's pretty insightful to understand that. And so now whenever I go out hunting, like, yes, you're wrapped up in your in your camo gear, but I won't go out with sun, like sunscreen. I won't go out with, with sunnies or anything like that. And I never come back red raw or anything. Like, you're fine. But, I mean, you're getting out a lot of the time without your shirt on, without any – like, you've got a pair of shorts on. That's about it. So it's it's kind of insightful to know that you can build up a tolerance. And it's almost like you need that first burn to get your layer, <laughs> get your layer ready. <laughs> yeah, I found – yeah, you're right. Like, normally um, I'm pretty much just wearing a set of – set of shorts and nothing else yeah and i i actually do have a bit of a game plan when it when it when it comes to the sun like i'll I'll just get little bits and pieces and slowly increase my time Mm -hmm. until like i like i'll start to know like as soon as i feel like um you can sort of feel the burn about to come on and then i'll i'll just pull up and then like over time like that time increases and i can like literally get to the stage where I'm probably still walking around without a shirt on up to like 11 or 12 during the day and I'm, and I'm not getting sunburned. Yeah. 
Yeah, you obviously have to be smart with it. Like, if you're feeling like you're getting burnt, you're getting burnt. There's no no joke to it, no yeah, lie yeah, to yeah, it. Like, yeah. it's definitely going to happen. Um, we're not talking about some superpower or anything. It's definitely a thing that we do need to be aware of here in Australia. But it's just interesting that we, the more sun con- conscious, sorry, more sun co- con- cautious we get, I'll get there, that uh, it just builds up. Uh, like, you don't build up the resilience that we should be building up. Yeah, look, some of the stuff I've looked into lately, <clears throat> I mean, I should say I'm not a doctor or, or um, yeah. don't don't take my health advice. <laughs> um, but then again, like whose health advice do you take? Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, uh, there's something to do with like your, your gut bacteria and your microbiome and your sun tolerance. So like say, uh, and obviously you need, it's, it's what it's, you need the sun to have good, gut function as well Mm -hmm. but uh like say you eat maybe a western diet that's definitely going to increase your inflammation in turn like so you're going to be less uh, you're going to be able to you're going to be less resistant to the sun like you're going to get sunburn a lot more and that's one thing i've definitely found like the the, now i eat like a more uh ancestral style cave cave and diet whatever you want to call it um yeah i think that's really really got a lot to do with it and then in the same same token like i really need sun now to keep good healthy functions in the Mm -hmm. body the other thing is like the darker skinned you are the more sun you need as well to be able to produce the correct amounts of vitamin d so my wife she has uh like her family from south africa and so she burns one day and she'll be tan the next. And it's just, she was actually vitamin D deficient for a while. So she started getting out the sun a whole heap more. And all of a sudden she's like, her vitamin D is completely fine. It's kind of crazy that we've got all the power that we need from the sun. But it, once again, it's just that thing that we're so scared of. So yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like how many millions or hundreds of thousands of years have we been on the planet and it's the last hundred years we shouldn't be out in the sun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's quite interesting. Hey. <laughs> dude um i would love to get into your time up north actually like the the time that you when you spent some time with some natives up there you did it i think did you do a course with them or did you just hang out with them and help them out for a few weeks yeah i've been lucky enough um to spend a bit of time with the indigenous people uh in, in the north mm-hmm. so when i first went traveling i met a guy up in the gulf and uh yeah, like it, it, to be honest, we've, we've become pretty good mates and he's invited me up a, a fair few times now. So I've, I've spent heaps of times up there with them and um, that's been awesome. And then that kind of uh, – I don't know if you've ever watched the Magic Pill documentary. No, I actually haven't uh, seen it. Yeah, anyway, I, I was watching that and there was a program in there called uh, Hope for Health and, and they were doing work up in Arnhem Land with, with the Indigenous people um, – you know, with like the ancestral diet and stuff. And I was like, oh, wow, like that's so awesome. Like that, I'd love to be part of that one day. Anyway, um, yeah, I just happened to be up in the Gulf at the time. And then uh, one of the ladies uh, running the program contacted me and asked if I'd like to go help. And I was hmm. like, hell yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, um, then I've spent a couple of months in Darwin helping out with the indigenous people up there. So hopefully I'm keen to get, back up there again actually because Arnhem Land is the only part in Australia that I have not been Mm. so I've left it till last and um I was actually yeah it was a pretty it's pretty um special I got uh, adopted by the indigenous people that's cool of of uh, Elko Island so yeah um, I've been invited up, so I'm pretty keen to get up there and what go does, hang out with them. Like that'd be awesome. What does that entail? Like you being adopted by them? How does that work? Um, I, I, I don't know if adopted's the right word, but they kind of just like accepted you into their tribe to some extent. So, sort of, I, yeah. I, I don't know the best way to describe it. Like they're just they have like these massive family structures. Mm-hmm. Like they're pretty complex. Um, and yeah, I guess I kind of uh, got invited into that family structure. Yeah, I don't know the best way to say it. Like I, I don't know if I'd call it tribe or, but yeah, like uh, I'm I'm in the family structure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's cool. And so I mean, some of the things that I saw you guys doing, like you were um, threading different vines to make, uh, like I don't know, there's so many things you were doing. You were collecting tubers and then you were washing them out. You were collecting um, vines and like 
almost like braiding them to make them into different bits and pieces. You're out hunting, taking some of them out hunting. Like what, what were the sort of things that you were getting into day by day? Yeah, a lot of the, the bushcraft stuff like that was more of a side part mm-hmm. to the retreat itself. But like the retreat mainly focused around the health and um, like uh, helping the indigenous people um, yeah, just more knowledge and food, mm-hmm. but you know, like keeping keeping their traditions as well. You know, so then they they you know that then they were showing us like uh, bush tuckers and bushcraft and uh, actually the baskets they were collecting um, pandanus leaves mm-hmm. and um, there's there's a pretty in depth process in in depth process actually, but yeah, like they were getting the pandanus leaves and then weaving them into baskets and earrings and all all other kinds of stuff and like cordage so that was pretty cool to actually um see and experience yeah definitely so. dude um and i mean with with those baskets and the the cordage and stuff that they're making what are they then using it for like just every day getting around life or is it being sold on uh to be honest like a lot of the stuff i'm sure they're making now is just more for just to keep the culture going yeah just arts and craft and just um, you know, a few baskets and um, I don't know, to be honest, how much they're actually using it for. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know if it is something maybe they do a whole lot of. Uh, it was just great that they still have that knowledge and, and they were showing us. But um, I'm sure, like I know maybe not so long ago, like they definitely would have been making, you know, baskets and fish traps and all kinds of things, you know. like Yeah, definitely. That was something you guys made, wasn't it? Some fish traps? Um, no, nah, not exactly. They, uh, what were they making? Yeah, not really. Like they pretty much are just making baskets. Um, yeah, I don't think we, well, we did a bit of fishing, but it was more with spears and, okay, maybe and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. My stories mixed up. How was that fishing for fishing with spears? Um, it was pretty good actually. Like the, the, uh, I don't know, like the, the weather and the wind in Darwin at the time wasn't the best, so mm. I don't know. We didn't didn't do too good with the spears, to be honest. But um, we ended up doing like we went into some mangroves and got some of the, like the mangrove worms. Yeah, um, that's right. That's yeah, right. like because the fishing fishing was no good, so we yeah just got the mangrove worms instead, and um that was yeah, that was an experience. <laughs> <laughs> they just looked like slimy mucus, really. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I must have eaten about a kilo because the the indigenous ladies there they're like, oh here have some more, have some more, have, and I was like, holy crap, I don't know if I can eat any more of this. Like it, it was all right, yeah. But I didn't, so I didn't realize that um, you meant to squeeze the mud out of the worms, <laughs> and I ate like a kilo of worms with all the mud inside, oh, and then one God. of the ladies is like, oh, what are you doing? You got to get the mud out, and I was like, oh no, like you're telling me now, like literally on the last worm I had. Oh, got the mud out of it, and I was like, "Ah, oh, damn it!" <laughs> How'd your guts hold up? Yeah, fine, actually. Oh, thankfully, just building so. up that immunity. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's awesome. So, I mean, something else that you've you've put up quite a lot is the different, or just actually. Oh, sorry, mate. Got a phone call going through. <laughs> um, yeah, the different. Oh, actually, just starting fires with your hands, um, doing the the getting your different wood out and just going through it how's that going for you or how was that process i guess learning to create fire just from a few sticks yeah um i I, i've always been interested in it like Mm -hmm. that kind of survival bushcraft kind of stuff um and like you know i used to watch a lot of american shows where they're you know doing all the survival stuff making fire sticks and um I was actually lucky enough. I got to catch up with one of the survivalist guys from America and he showed me how to, to actually make fire with sticks. And I was like, like I was just mind blown. Like I've always wanted to do it, but you know, I'd never, I don't know like why I didn't really step into it. Like when I was kids, you know, we used to muck around trying to do it. And, yeah. you know, you'd get the, you'd get, yeah, you get a bit of a smell. You'd be like, Oh, I think it's about to go. And you could like smell something happening, but like it never would. So he showed me the right woods to use, and um, yeah, it started from there. And it's 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 been a real mission because it's, uh, I mean, maybe for some people it's pretty easy, but for myself, like it's it's a real mission because like one day you can nail it and you'd be like, mm. yes, like I'm getting really good at this, and then the next day, 
you can't you can't get a fire and i was like ah. so it, it, it it's really good like it keeps me on my toes and it's i don't know it's it, there's something about making a fire from from scratch like it's so primitive and primal like there's mm-hmm. just you can't explain it it's just like this awesome feeling you get when you've just made fire from like literally some from sticks off a tree it's crazy and does it so, matter like it obviously matter on how dry the wood is um maybe that's why some days it would work and other days it wouldn't or are you you're literally just peeling it off the tree and going for it um yeah like the wood has to be a little bit dry so i think um like say you did get fresh fresh branches branches off a tree like you'd maybe have to let it sit for two days or three days or something like that to, to dry out enough to actually get a fire with it. Unless you found some, some straight sticks yeah. on the on the ground ready to go, already dried. But And what are the woods, yeah. like what, which trees are the best ones to be using, the wood to be using? Uh, anything straight and fast growing and a softer kind of wood. Okay. That's, that's what you're looking for. Like there's so many types of trees that, that'll work. Like, yeah. I've ra- raided my dad's garden, and one of his <laughs> garden hedges would make fire. Like it's not, you can make fire out of the most random sticks. Yeah, but um, I mean, probably not at the moment. I think like everywhere's on fire band at the moment, yeah, so yeah, that's exactly. why you haven't. That's why I've been doing any fire making for a little while. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, dear, fair enough. Um, and so I mean, like, how long does it take you from start to finish? I know that varies depending on what the wood's like, but um, what's the fastest it's taking you compared to the longest it's taking you? Ah. Uh, on a good day, I probably could get a fire in like one or two minutes. Yep. That's that's like that's pretty decent. That's from start to finish. That's not like literally just rubbing the sticks together. That's from like actually cutting the groove in and the the notches and and doing all that. Yeah, like I could probably nearly get a fire going in like one or two minutes. Wow. I think I think I've seen guys do it in like three seconds. So I've got a way. I've got a little way to go yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's hefty. I, I remember just sitting there for ages doing it when I was younger. Like it felt like ten minutes and never got anything. Probably not doing it fast enough or, or any of that side of things. But yeah, I still just remember struggling hard. <laughs> yeah. Um. I. I mean. I, as you, as I've been traveling around, like whenever I find the right kind of woods, I just test them out. Like to be honest, um, that's how I've kind of worked it out as I've been going. But yeah, like if you grab the wrong type of wood, you could be there for like, you could be there all day rubbing the sticks together and nothing mm. will happen. And that's where you kind of come unstuck because you think, oh, yeah, like surely this wood would have to work. Yes. And then, you know, you keep mucking around with it and nothing happens and you end up with like, blisters everywhere yeah i'm gonna blame it on that i didn't have the right wood <laughs> um for like how long did you ever actually live completely off the land when you're out and about or do you always kind of have your own little supplies with you food wise um so recently oh well maybe not recently like uh not so long ago i went up uh into the gulf with my brother and I guess we had our cars close, but basically for two months, we literally only ate what we could hunt with our bows. Mm -hmm. That was it. So um, we had access to water, but just we were just drinking so much water because we were pretty active that, you know, I was just, I just had a, I have like a hundred liter stainless steel tank in my trailer. Like we were given, given that a pizzling. (laughs) Um, But other than that, I mean, yeah, that that that's probably like the most, I guess, hardcore it's been. Yeah, like just literally, and then yeah, basically, well, basically, we just ate wild beef for two months. <laughs> so what would happen? You'd get a you'd get a kill, and then you'd just hang the meat and shade all day long. Or how are you how are you rolling with it? Uh, no, pretty much how it had to work was uh, we would we would basically hope and try to get a hunt in the afternoon. So then, you know, you might be processing the meat into the night, night, but at least it was starting to cool off. And then we'd just leave, leave the meat out to cool down because, uh, I don't know if anyone's tried it. If you put like, you know, 60 kilos of, um, hot meat into your angle, nothing's going to happen. Yeah. (laughs) Did you make that mistake once before? 
Yeah. <laughs> um, the meat, the meat didn't go bad. The meat didn't go bad. It's just my my poor fridge. Like I got like flat batteries just because the fridge was just like working so, so hard, hard to try to cool cool the meat down. Yeah. So you've got to you've got to let it cool down before you put it in the fridge. Um. <laughs> or, um. To be honest, I mean this is probably really bad advice to give, but I've found that. I mean, it's been like full, like 40 degrees and I've been processing meat in the morning mm. and it's probably still like 12 o'clock and there's flies all over the meat and it's hot as, and um, I just, I still just wait for it to cool down. I'll throw some leaves or something over it and put it in the shade. Yeah. And um, touch wood, I haven't had meat go bad yet. Yeah, well. Well, maybe it has, maybe it has gone bad, <laughs> but I just can't register oh, anymore. Guts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually so, went yeah. to a talk uh, at a local like club recently and they were talking about the state of it and I, I, I wasn't paying enough attention because I was talking to another guy during it, but he was definitely talking about the heats and stuff that you can get it, that you can let it go to. Um, and he had this little sequence of, of how it worked and I'm doing a terrible job because I'm butchering it completely, but it was like, I don't know, they had like 5 and 30. And so it was like if it's over 30 degrees for five hours or something along those lines, that's when it can be an issue. Um, but I mean, when you're talking about the temperatures of up north, it's like that all the time. So I, I don't know, it can be pretty forward pretty quickly, I guess. Yeah, uh, actually I did find, so with the beef, uh, like you really did have to uh, get processing pretty quick or get it in the shade because yeah, the meat would go hot. Yeah, we were like the, the meat, like you could just see, like it literally started to cook. Yeah, and then it wasn't it wasn't the best. Then like you, that was the stuff we were eating first. Um, still, I mean, it was okay. It was definitely not as tasty if it mm. stayed hot for too long. Mm-hmm. Um, but the pork, because though we shot a few wild pigs and. Yeah, we had to be at, I don't know, like just with what I've heard about pork and stuff and the heat, we were, we were a bit more careful with the pork, but I did find that it would taint so much faster in the heat. Mm. Like beef seemed to be okay like it, with a bit of heat and it would last, a, you know, like you had a bit more leeway. You could get away with a bit more, but yeah. with the pork, like um, luckily they're smaller animals. Like they're, they're a lot easier and quicker to process, mm. but yeah, you had to be had to be on the game with them. So, like, say we got one in the middle of the day, <laughs> you know, we we're having to process it pretty quick. Cause just... <laughs> but, I mean, like, obviously, you, you're just not taking the whole carcass then, right? Like, when it happens, if you've only got your little angle fridge to, to cool it back down, you're just leaving a fair bit of the meat behind. Yeah. Uh, at the time, my brother had uh, his fridge there. So, um, we were sort of boning the beef out, you'd say. Yeah. And the ribs, the ribs would take up a lot of freezer room. So, yeah, once you like bone it out, um, and the the scrub cattle we were chasing up in the Gulf, like they're they're probably a bit smaller than your average yeah not like a cow down beast. here. So yeah, it probably wasn't as much meat on them as you'd think. Mm-hmm. And then what we were doing, so yeah, we would we'd eat the ribs first because the ribs would just, they'd just take up so much rib room, yeah. fridge room. Yeah. You know, you chuck like your front quarter and your hind quarter and your back straps and all the organ meats in the fridge. Uh-huh. And then, um, yeah, we'd just throw the, uh, the, the ribs on, on the hot coals and just cook them up straight away. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, to be honest, like, uh, sometimes maybe there was a little bit of wastage on, on a really big scrub ball. Um, but, you did pretty well. Yeah, maybe maybe it wasn't as as bad as you'd think. Hey, and then yeah. uh, also, so yeah, like I didn't shoot too many of them. Um, my mate, my indigenous mate up there, he um, eats a lot of beef. So you know, we we'd only we'd only go maybe chase the the scrub cattle like when he wasn't keen to go hunt any, and then mm-hmm. um, we'd just go help him, and then he'd just give us like you know mad rib fillet and eye fillet cuts off all the steak and so then um, so 
yeah, we wouldn't have to like didn't have to um, take too many beasts down. You know what I mean? Like try not yeah. to waste too many. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with the pork, so many people were so scared of the the pork here in Australia as to when to eat it and when not to eat it. And I mean, obviously you're up there during it. It was during a bit of a wet time, wet season up there. So maybe they weren't feasting or having to feast off of everything that's dead but i mean what was your kind of thoughts around the pork for for eating it and you weren't freezing it or anything before you'd eat it you typically kill the pork and then eat it that day right yeah okay yeah so i have heard stories about people getting sick from eating pork mm-hmm. so that's a really tough call um i haven't had any issues yet yeah. to be honest touch wood um I, w- I would be pretty careful where I am eating the the pigs from though. Like there, there was definitely pigs feasting on like dead carcasses yeah. and probably wouldn't be chasing one of them down them. to eat. Yeah. yeah. We were sort of um, back in – then again, there's nothing to say that the pigs that we ate probably didn't just feed off a dead carcass and then walk over to like the, you know, the yams and the water holes and yeah. stuff. <laughs> um, but I guess, yeah, they were like – they were getting finished on like yes. plants. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Maybe they had a little bit of time to clean out first. <laughs> but yeah, I, I have heard of people eating the pigs and, and getting sick. I don't know how common or whatever that occurs. Maybe that has a bit to do with your gut bacteria too. Like I know most people that get sick from eating pigs um, are people that would eat um, like a normal fast food diet. Mm hmm. And then, you know, they go out hunting and then they start eating like all this really gamey meat and then they kind of get a bit crook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't know how how much that has a play a, a role to play in it. I'd say it has to, it would have a little bit to do with it though because um, I find, yeah, like I eat a lot of nasty, gnarly stuff and t- <laughs> touched wood uh, as far as like maybe rank meat or, you know, weird stuff you know, eating weird stuff goes, I, I've seen to be okay so far. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe the guts has built up a bit of a tolerance. Well, I mean, are you checking their livers and things like that? Like when you first cut them open and making sure that there's no spots or, or sign of anything in the in the gut? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. no, definitely. Like, it's definitely. not like you're just going wild for it. You're actually taking precautions as you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe it does sound like I'm just, you know, being a cowboy about it. But no, definitely <laughs> – um, Definitely being careful. Like if it if it looks sick or something, you wouldn't eat it. Need it. No. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like we're definitely you know checking the organs and all that sort of stuff. Um. Yeah. You you want you want to be as smart about it as you can. Mm. Uh, I guess it depend how hungry you were would 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 be and like what you'd what limits you'd you'd go. But yeah, I, I don't know. Just the area that we're in. Just I've been pretty lucky. Like all the animals have been pretty healthy. Yeah. To eat. So I haven't really found anything too weird yet like mm-hmm. like yeah like they've all been pretty clean i'd say no that's cool um and so i mean something that you i was just going to bring up i'm just looking at your instagram page now because it's always pretty cool it brings up some good conversation <laughs> um i mean something that you talked about before was actually the snakes like playing with snakes a lot when you were younger Do, is that just been something that has been like a, a passion from when you were younger, just catching snakes and putting them in different places. I know a lot of your videos is like moving a snake off of the road, for instance, to make sure it doesn't get run over. Um, is that just something that your brothers taught you or did you just kind of have interest yourself in it? Yeah, I guess um, uh, growing up, like, you know, watched like Steve Owen and, yeah. you know, the Bush Tucker Man and Malcolm Douglas and all those kind of guys and just always just love nature and just was always just amongst it, you know, catching animals and stuff. So it, it's kind of gone on from there. And, yeah, like as I've been traveling around, like, you know, I'll see a snake on the road, so I'll just hop out and pick it up and move it off the road or, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, those kinds of things. So it's kind of just progressed from there. To be honest, I've been doing it that long. I don't even – it's just second nature to me now. I don't, yeah. don't even really think about it that much. That's it's, just, it's just so normal from, from where I'm from to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're getting out, when you get out and move them off the road, are you um, spending a bit of time with them first or are you pretty comfortable just to grab them and make sure they don't bite you? Uh, I don't play around with venomous snakes too much, to be honest, because yeah. normally I'm out pretty remote. So far, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I guess, it, like, like, in a way, too, for some reason, I just always seem to run into pythons. Mm-hmm. I've, I've just been pretty lucky. Like, 
you know, I haven't really had too many encounters like where I've had to like go rescue a venomous snake. Yeah. Um, it's just been the way I guess it's kind of worked out. But yeah, I, I don't know. I just sort of give them a bit of a wide berth. And uh, with the pythons, it just depends on the timing. Like if, if I picked up an animal and it was pretty calm and casual and wasn't too worried, maybe I'd a bit of a look at it and then, you know, just walk it off and put it down. But if you, you know, you're definitely going to find animals that are stressed and, um, yeah, they're just the ones I pick up and move and put down and, and probably am not going to take a photo or a video or anything of that actually. Like that, that, there's so much stuff that I do do that never ever makes it, you know, like, yeah, I, I try not to use my phone or anything like too much actually. So yeah, yeah, very small amount of stuff actually gets, gets, shown. gets up with uh, the animal. That's good. It's, uh, uh, yeah. When I first started going out hunting, I was in the debacle of trying to film everything, like trying to get my experience on camera. And I'm like, what the heck for? Like, how about you just go and experience it yourself first? And once once you've got it nailed, maybe then you can look into getting, like bringing a camera and doing yourself filming or something like that. But I'm like, for now, why don't you just get out and actually enjoy it? So occasionally the phone will be in the pocket or I'll put a GoPro to my chest. But outside of that, like, I think you just put too much focus on it and then everything else comes undone. Um Whereas if you're just out and you just get to enjoy it yourself, you're like, oh, wow, it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Like that's one thing I've found. Um, I, I do plan to maybe try to film a little bit more mm-hmm. now as I've been traveling because I've been pretty slack the last three years, to be honest. I've just been enjoying it like yeah. how you've been talking about. But, yeah, that, that's what I've found. Like I don't tend to video or film or even show too much of my hunting, to be honest, because it's, um, it's like a it, – uh, not to get too hippy dippy, but I don't know. It's like a pretty special experience to me. Yeah. So I really try to be in it and yeah. really enjoy it. And I have found that uh, not always. I mean, some people make amazing self, you know, filmed like little clips of themselves hunting and stuff like that. And this yeah. is like hell yes, like I wish I could do that. But I don't know. I just get so engrossed in the, in the action when I'm out hunting that I. You know, it's, I, I kind of want to be, I kind of want to be right in the moment and really enjoy it. And mm-hmm. it just, it, it definitely is hard to be there in the moment when you're trying to film it. Yeah. And plus the fact, usually when I'm trying to film, I end up making a noise or uh-huh. bloody doing something and then scaring off an animal. I'm like, ah, oh, should have just, should just gone for it. <laughs> yeah, should have just, I shouldn't have been farting around with that. So. I mean, it's so unnatural to hear anything metallic or anything. Uh, like, for instance, one thing I'm thinking of is I picked up my phone once to try a video of some deer and my my release aid hit the, the phone and that little chink, that was enough for them to just be like, ah, something's up and they just took off. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. um, usually, I guess, too, a lot of the time when I am out hunting, I am literally doing it to try to get some food. Yeah. So... <laughs> I, it's I, like, I'm like, oh, I don't, really don't want to stuff this up. So <laughs> like, I try to really try to be in it. Maybe that's maybe that's my problem. Maybe that's why I haven't been as successful as I should have been. I haven't been relying on it for food yet. Yeah, if you go out and, and um, you go hungry for a few days, I, I can tell you you'll definitely become a better hunter. Instinct becomes <laughs> a lot more in tune, I'd say. Yeah, you'll probably just run it down on foot and you probably won't even need the bow actually if you're hungry enough. <laughs> so um, what what are kind of the plans for you now? Like I know you're heading over to Western Australia soon. What's like, is there is there an end date to this nomad life that you're living or is it kind of, you're good for right um, now? To be honest, I, uh, I'm not too sure exactly what my plans are. Like I know I just... I was like, stuff it. Like, I really want to get up to Arnhem Land. Um, I haven't been there. I definitely want to do it before I um, – I don't know if the right word would be settle or work properly. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the plan is to – yeah, I'm going to head over to Perth and then do another full lap of Australia. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and then um, – why I travel around, a lot of people have reached out and they want to maybe possibly come out with me and have a bit of an experience, either like, you know, mucking around, doing a hike or yeah. uh, doing, doing some of the survival stuff or, yeah, even like some people want to experience a hunt, mm-hmm. uh, whether that be watching me or, um, you know, That's me taking thing. someone out, guiding them on an experience. So yeah. at the moment, I'm just navigating that. Um, there's a crew of guys in Perth that have asked me to 
go over there and give them uh, some tips on um, bow hunting and yeah, they, they want me to go out and uh, go through the process of bow hunting a goat and, you know, processing it, cooking it up, like the whole mm-hmm. start to finish process. So yeah, like I, I guess uh, in a way that'll be a small piece of what I want to do, but yeah, I want to take guys out in the bush or, or, mm. or men or women, uh, you know, and um, yeah, sort of get them reconnected with nature, whether that be, you know, gathering food or just enjoying nature or mm. some kind of nature experience. That's for, yeah, that's the plan. So that's awesome. Man. I think it's so powerful. Like it's definitely what's, I think, Getting into bow hunting was cool. Uh, or going, getting into archery in general, in general was cool because it started to give me like a little bit of a meditative practice of something that was enjoyable. It's like, hey, you don't have to sit down and just do meditation. You can shoot your bow and be kind of like mindful about it and all of a sudden you're getting like a lot of stress relief or, or whatever from it. And then I started getting out in the wild a lot more and it, it is that reconnection with nature and you, you really start to understand like what you're missing out on from being in the city. So I feel like that is so powerful and that there's actually so much so much help that people can get just from going for a walk in, in nature. It's, it's super incredible. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, like the, the amount of people that have reached out to me to have that experience um, – it's pretty awesome, actually. Like, I feel quite honoured that people uh, would send me those messages to have that experience. And, um, I mean, ultimately, I have my PT cert and all that sort of stuff, and I was possibly thinking about, you know, using that to help people in some way, you know, like sort of in my own health journey. I've learned a lot, and I'd like, oh, like, you know, I would love to help people on their health journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but also – connecting with nature um has been you know a massive part of my healing and 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 growth and it seems to be at this stage that that's um what people would love to come and experience with me so yeah like i'd love to um go down this path more i mean it's Mm. starting yeah like uh if it works out with these guys in perth like they'll be the first crew of guys that i'll take out um more legitimately i should say yeah i mean i'm taking heaps of people out just as I've been traveling around. But, uh, yeah, like to, to actually maybe turn it into a little bit of um, pocket money as I travel around would be yeah, would definitely. be cool and see where it goes, yeah. No, that's incredible, man. And um, one last question, I guess, before we kind of wrap things up, but while you're traveling around, like how are you getting access? I think that's probably a big thing. In particular, I had a lot of people reaching out to me recently saying that they're losing access right now because of the drought. Like that's something that a lot of farmers are saying, hey, you know what? Like we can't afford you to have run, like have you on the property anymore. What we're going to do is actually herd up the goats and sell them off. Um, or they're just saying, hey, there's just, there's too much risk with you being out here right now just because it's way too dry. Like we're, we're getting rid of everything just by gunning it down or, or whatever it might be. So, how are you getting access when you're kind of traveling all around the, uh, around Australia? And obviously it's different depending on which state you're in, but what's your kind of go to? Yeah. Um, I've been pretty lucky. Like where initially when I first started bow hunting, um, I mean, I'm, I'm off a cattle property, so mm. I had access to all that. And then I have found since I've been traveling, to be honest, usually when I just tell people that I'm bow hunting, like that I bow hunt and usually cause I'm trying to get a bit of tucker doing it. Most people are, more happy. than happy to just let me go do it hey like yeah because not really causing much harm i'm not trying to you know chase the biggest baddest animal or anything i'm just no not you just getting something just... Just, yeah, just getting something for the fridge you know like so most people are pretty happy to let me do that and um to be honest because normally i've been in like queensland uh the northern territory wa I've spent more time in maybe the sort of more northern parts of Australia. Mm-hmm. So most people up there have been pretty keen. A bit more, it's a bit more being, accepted, yeah, bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit more accepted. Like I guess down um, in like the southeast corner where it's sort of really heavily built, there's a lot more people. Mm. It would be a bit harder to get access down there. Yeah. And that's, to be honest, usually when I've been down there, um, the only times I've even – hunted down there at all have just been with mates or something like that Mm -hmm. so and they're 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 probably the sort of places where i'm i have to revert back to going to the shops or the butchers (laughs) to get my food down there but um yeah i mean yeah bow hunting is not the only way i get food like you know there's so many other ways like fishing or whatever but um i've just found in my time traveling normally yeah in the 
more northern remote parts of Australia, you know, I've, I run into the farmers all the time because, you know, normally they're pulling up, like asking me about my trailer and my setup. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to go knock over a pig or something. And they're like, oh, yeah, sure. So I've just been pretty lucky in that way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it, yeah. it goes down to a lot of what you just said is based on how the conversation starts and how how you're actually wording it. Like if you just say, hey, can I come hunting on your property? You straight straight away get associated with that bogan Australia and Australian who's going to go out and shoot everything that they see. Whereas it's like, hey, can I come and get some food from your, your property? Like, can I come and go hunting for food? It changes the conversation. It's like, like you said, going for bow hunting for food rather than, hey, I'm a hunter. Can I be on your land? It, it, it does kind of, it, it comes across a lot less aggressive, I think. Yeah, uh, it's a tricky one to navigate because I'm I'm mates with like a lot of the bow hunters in the bow hunting community, and um, mm. I mean, yeah, like everyone's got their own. I'm not going to say that someone that maybe just hunts for the passion of hunting and probably doesn't eat what they oh, they no. shoot. Like, I'm not going to bash them because I mean, ultimately we are removing a pest species from Australia. Yeah, definitely. I wasn't trying to do uh, that. If that's what yeah, it came yeah, across yeah. No, as, no, yeah. No, no. Um, but, but I've just found that I, because I pretty much have the aim to eat what I hunt, mm. it really just changes the way that people react to what I do. Mm-hmm. And I, it, people are more accepting yeah. of what I do mm. because um, a lot of the time too, like as I know, like hunters will be like, oh, there's nothing, like that block's no good, there's nothing on there worth hunting but it probably generally means there's nothing big and bad on there with big yeah. horns or whatever to hunt. It's there's just like it's probably heaps rabbits of little or something. Small. Yeah, yeah, and it's like oh well, that's sweet. Like I'm I'm only out there to get a bit of tucker. So I mean, like when I initially started bow hunting, like I was right into that as well. You know, trying to find the biggest animals or the coolest thing. Like, you know, like how, however you want to explain it. Like I guess that was there, and maybe that's in us to a degree. But the more that I've eaten animals and you know, like I, I do have a bit of a, a more understanding of like, I don't know, like life force and stuff mm-hmm. like with animals and that. Like I, I do find it hard as I've gone down this path. Like I can't really hunt something without a reason anymore. Yeah. Like I don't know if, if if I'm getting soft or what you'd want to call it. I, I do know other bow hunters that are sort of feeling the same way. Like I don't know. It, it feels – I don't know. It's oh, I don't even like. I just I, don't even. I think it's a bit more innate to us, right? Like we only, or ancestrally, we would have only hunted for food. It wouldn't have been just to kill off anything. Um, and maybe there's that understanding now that if we do just keep killing, that eventually something can become extinct. So it's a bit more innate. Like, hey, we we share this land together. So you don't want to just go whacking and stacking necessarily. Like for something like the pests, the pigs that are now getting paid, that you get paid per snout here in Queensland and um, the dogs, like you get paid per skin that you're giving, like that's a bit more understandable because it now, it now becomes a resource. But I think, yeah, I think what you're saying is very relatable. Yeah, exactly what you're talking about. Like normally, yeah, when I bow hunt, I'm usually just out trying to give it a tucker. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to put any dint on the feral animal population single-handedly <laughs> by myself you know, with my bow. Like there's heaps of other people out there that are keen to do that, and um, you know what I mean. Like then, yeah. like that's cool too. Everyone's got their own their own way of doing things, or yeah, like there is there's there, like you said, yeah, there is people out there doing the the shoots or whatever they whatever ways they're controlling the animals. But um, yeah, I don't know. My past just trying to get a bit of bit of tucker at this stage, you know. So. If you had the choice, what what would be your one go to tucker for animal wise? What would be your your choice of animal? Uh, to be honest, the scrub cattle in the Gulf taste pretty good. Yeah. The the deer that I got down in Victoria, that fallow buck, mm-hmm. that was amazing. Yeah. It like I probably I'll probably have to say that was probably one of the better things I've I've got <laughs> to eat, but um, they're pretty few and far between normally where where I am, so. Yeah, I uh, I've had fallow deer once, and it was yeah, it was so so nice, and didn't it wasn't really gamey at all compared to the reds that I've eaten quite a lot. It's um, 
it's quite a gamey taste. Like you, you kind of got to cook it out of it to make sure you're not getting that that straight taste. But even I found mincing the meat makes such a big difference. It just changes the the texture and the flavor of it straight away. So I had some pretty gaming red meat. Oh, sorry, red deer meat, and I ended up grinding it through the mincer, and it was such a difference. I was so surprised that just doing that was a enough to kind of take the the bite away from it. Yeah, I, I, th- I think it has a lot to do with how you, how you cook it as well. Like yeah. my tip, my tips, um, if you cook it on the fire, probably in like cast iron, mm-hmm. you can't go wrong, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That smoky smell that you get from cooking over a real fire is just so good. Yeah. No, that's it. Like it, you just nothing's going to beat that. Like you could probably cook a rock in your camp oven, and it's probably going to taste all right. <laughs> Depending on how how desperate you get, hey. No, <laughs> oh, dude, that's cool. Well, I think that's probably a good place to wrap. So, where can people kind of follow along? I mean, we talked about socials. I, I really think that everyone should jump across to your Instagram page. I think you do a good job there, just um, kind of bringing the wilderness to to us city slickers when we're sitting in our everyday lives but where else can people kind of follow along um yeah like mostly i guess i just uh, i just i'm on, on instagram uh don't tend to use facebook or anything like that too much like i'm probably going to do a little bit of youtube but yeah basically instagram's my link to everything mm-hmm. yeah that's so cool that, that'd be a place for people to find me yeah yeah i did see you've got a few youtube channels sorry a few youtube videos up now which is just kind of collections of your stories that you put up on instagram so i mean yeah. there's a few people that when I, I switch on instagram I, I typically just watch a few stories to see what's going on it's always quite enjoyable and yours is one of those ones i think um you and luke roberts is another one he's always got some no sorry john and luke he's always got some um some good content on there um yeah yeah it's cool yeah, cheers, man. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. I've been pretty slack lately, but I'll uh, try to. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'm definitely going to use it a little bit more yeah. in the future. Be yeah. more sociable on it. <laughs> oh, definitely, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time, dude. It's been um, it's a bit few and far between right now with the time of year trying to get people online for the podcast. So I appreciate you taking the time, dude. No, thank you, man. Uh, it's, I've been looking forward to this chat for a long time. So yeah, it's great to finally have a bit of it. Yeah, Make have, it have a good chat. Dude. Definitely, dude. All right. Well, thanks for joining the show.